up Mr. Gerald Barclay. Gerald, welcome to Focus on Liberia. I'm here, I'm here. I appreciate you inviting me. All right. Me. So briefly about Gerald, he's a professional known as the GB. He's the director, producer, writer, cinematographer, and editor. His story begins after fleeing the devastating civil war in Liberia. He settled in New York City and graduated with a communication degree from City University of New York. He gained early fame making experience on Abel Ferrara's King of New York, Spike Lee's Jungle Fever, before enrolling into a mentorship on the Emmy Award winning filmmaker Tony Lover at Liberty Studios. He then formed his own production company known as GB Productions and went on to help hundreds of music videos for artists such as Wu-Tang Clan, Master P, Snoop Dogg, Bounty Killer, uh, Mystica, Pig Pong, and the Gap Band. Always, GB wants to reinvent himself. He sought new challenges. His first future film, Bloody Street, a greedy urban trailer won critical praise and a vision award at the 2002 Pan African Film Festival and was released through Artisan Home Entertainment. Gerald, once again, welcome to Focus on Liberia. Thank you, thank you, thank We're you. We're so glad to have you, your big name out there. <laughs> I'm trying my best, I'll be honest so with you. There's so many things I feel I still have to do, you know? Definitely. Uh, we. So this is our focus on library. We want to welcome our guests and our we want to welcome our viewers across the world. This is our last edition for the year. And so we thought to, to end strong. That's why we invited you, Jerry. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you got me too, man. We've been running around with obviously with Fatima's revenge and everything else. So that's perfect. Great. So since this is focused on Liberia, even though I read a little bit about you. But let, let me uh, tell us briefly, you know, about your connection with, with Liberia. Well, you know, like most people, you know, I left Liberia when I was very young. So by the time we came to America, we had to make the whole adjustment here. I got here when I was 12. So imagine being in a whole different land at 12 years old. I have a son that's 12 now, and I imagine, you know, having to adapt to a new culture, everything else at that, at that age. But, um, and you know, the memories faded. And then I was fortunate enough to travel back to Liberia back in 2000 and in 2000 actually. And I, I didn't make it into Liberia, I went to Ghana. And then I started documenting my other documentary called The Love of Liberty. So that worked pretty well. Great. Now I, I read your profile and I see that oh, you are a producer and director a writer, a cinematographer, and also an editor. Just tell my uh, viewing audience exactly what you do for each of those roles. Producer, director, writer, cinematographer, sure, sure. editor. Uh, um, pro a producer is someone that actually makes things happen. I mean, you hire a crew, you pull stuff together. And when you work independently, you have to be able to do that. The great thing about attending film school in the United States is that you'll be able to, um, um, by the time you get out, you have to know how to do every part of that. So they teach you producing. Uh, cinematography obviously, obviously is being able to use the cameras. Uh, directing is just being able to get your vision across. Uh, and finally, editing is be able to put it all together. So when you look at all of the elements of filmmaking, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I think I lost you. Oh, I, I see you. Oh, okay, yeah. For some reason, it's, it doesn't show me. Okay, I'm here. Good. So, yeah, so all of those elements, by the time you graduate from school, you should be able to know how to do it all. And uh, once you get into the real world, that's when the work really begins because of a lot of people. Um, I didn't get a chance to really get a good sense of it until I worked on the Spike Lee movie and I have people that travel from all over the world, from South Africa, many of the uh, elite black colleges in the United States, and even, you know, from NYU, which is one of the highest uh, standards of film schools in the United States. And we all are working on the same level, running and getting coffee and being able to do all these smaller tasks. But I was able to get a good grasp of what filmmaking was because 
that's where I met, you know, uh, Russell, I forgot Russell um, Williams' name, I think is his name, but he had just won Academy Award for Dances with Wolves. And I met Ruthie Carter, who was doing um, costumes for Spike Lee at the time, but nobody really knew her until she just did the costume for Black Panther. And I think she's nominated for an Academy Award and a slew of a whole bunch of people who worked on those on that project. Good. I, I also see that you work with uh, people, artists like Snoop Dogg, Master P. Yeah, Wizard. yeah, yeah. I, I actually, when I got out of film school, I needed to start building a, a resume. And literally, that's when hip hop, the hip hop music video scene was picking up. And I just so happened to be connected with the guys from Staten Island who were just about to come out too. So they approached me to do some video projects. And because I was in Liberty Studios, and it gave me access to all the film equipment at the time, and it really set everything off the right way. So they were able to take advantage of the resources that I had. Um, so that connection with Wu Tang brought me into the hip hop music video scene, and then I connected with groups like Illinois Scratch, Heather B, um, uh, Mad Lion, and all these people that we ended up doing projects for in the early '90s, which is like the Renaissance and of hip hop. And basically that funded into me getting signed to No Limit with Master P. So I ended up working under his company. Uh, I was signed for two years. I did a year and a half and then I came back to New York to start working on my next project, which was my first feature film. So, so what was it like working with uh, Snoop Dogg? What, what did you, exactly did you do for them? Oh, I actually directed two music videos that Snoop Dogg was in. Um, once he was signed as an artist to No Limit. And, you know, at the time, Master P produced, you know, maybe about five to 10 music videos a month. And they needed a team of people to be able to handle it. And because I had just come from working with Wu-Tang, it was really good because I was already seasoned and ready to rock, you know, very fast paced, under a lot of pressure. To do it and make stuff happen, so I was able to handle it and it actually worked out. Let, let's start very basic. You know, you have a film producer, movie producer, you know, a film, a movie producer. What's the difference? And you have other things like um, they're all pretty much connected. I mean, um, the technology changed, but the theory is still there. Uh, basically. Um, music videos are like little small movies where it's like three minutes long and it normally takes about a day or two to shoot. You can probably pull it together in a little less than a week. And then it takes, you know, maybe a little less than a week to edit. Some videos turned around within 72 hours you had a project. Once you got a machine going, it's much easier. Films, on the other hand, is a little bit more, requires a lot more um, pre-production and the, you start with the script and the writing and all of that stuff has to be in place and you got to get a budget and the budget is much higher on a feature film than it is on a music video. So when you look at it, um, once all those pieces come together, you can then get started shooting the movie. That process normally takes anywhere between three weeks to two months on the average to shoot a movie. And then, you know, it could take you up to six months to edit it, to be able to get it out. So a lot of times it, the whole process from beginning to end for a movie takes about a year. Hmm. I, I know I started uh, with the music of your mom, B. Barclay singing, you know, Kelly, <laughs> one of the first uh, librarian YouTuber that I watched. So <laughs> is, is it safe to say that you come from a family of uh, artists? Uh, Oh, that is definitely true. A lot of the creativity came from um, her involving us in, into the stuff. She's very, very creative. A lot of the things we were doing as kids kind of just set us up for that. Right now, she's heavily into uh, crafts and art and you know, events planning. So all of those things came in handy because right now, um, I remember her introducing us to American movies when we lived in Liberia in the 70s when we were taken to the cinema and watching everything from American movies to Indian movies where we were able to really you know, enjoy that. I just got a love for it and kept to it. And when I came here, I decided you know, either go into the military or <laughs> get into filmmaking. And I decided to go to school for film 
television production. So, so uh, where and how did your passion for filmmaking begin? I'm sorry, said that last part again. When and how did your fashion, your, your passion for uh -huh. filmmaking begin? I think that's what I'm saying. I think it cultivated over the years. And sometimes you didn't realize, and I meet some people now who love film. They never got into film, but they know Eddie can tell you everything about every movie. They can critique what was good about it and then so on and so forth. So I just uh, was fascinated with it in Liberia. You know, one of the earliest things is you look behind the television set to see where the people were. <laughs> and, you know, and whereas I, the more I explored that theory, I learned, you know, that, oh, this is how it's done, the film, and then they broadcast the signal that becomes a part of the TV, or finding little strips of film, film strips around the different cinemas in Liberia, and you realize you can hold it up to the light, you can see, you know, it might have been like, you know, six or seven frames, but you can see the stills from there. So it really has been a long process because technology finally caught up where it made it affordable to, you could use your cell phone now to do stuff. I mean, when I did, you know, Fatima's Revenge, there's some scenes that I honestly shot on my cell phone and put it in there. Okay, so first of all, you said in your uh, profile, you're a writer. Does that, you, do you write books or you write the script for the movies? And yeah, movies? actually, just I just authored my first memoir it focuses on the first 25 years of me as a filmmaker. It's called Shooting the Clan, which is a reference to the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, and I kind of chronicled my entire journey from coming from Liberia to uh, linking up with them, you know, shooting their first videos and then for, you know, going all the way forward to where I am now, shooting my second feature film. I shot four other documentaries uh, in between that. Um, and so it's, it's, like I said, it's a long process, but it definitely works. So writing, as we speak, I'm actually writing my next project right here for one of my writers. We're working on the Effie movie. So, um, it's interesting, you know, it's a process and I have stuff that I have written for years. Anytime I get an idea, I just write it down and I can expand something from one sentence into an entire movie or a music video concept or a short film. So, you know, we are constantly inundated with a lot of ideas. So it's just a matter of writing it down. So like, I remember a few years ago, I went in, I actually started compiling everything and say, okay, every time I get an idea, I write it down. And one day I stopped, I opened it up and I had literally 54 concepts of movies, television shows. And I'm like, okay, I got to get busy because that's a lot of work, but um, and it, it's fascinating to see how easily things can come together. And it's funny how people, sometimes they can't come up with ideas and there are some people who have ideas that are just waiting for the funding, you know? Right. So, so describe for me the entire process of that idea up to uh, us watching it on television or buying the DVD. Well, I can give you an example of uh, what we're working on now. I mean, Fatima's Revenge, started off as a short film. I got my buddy Musa Sese from Staten Island. He's another Liberian filmmaker. And uh, he called me up one day and said, yeah, let's do something together. And I was like, okay, let's. So we came up with an idea. He sent me an idea of one thing. I was like, ah, I don't know if it was gonna work. So he sent me another idea, which I thought has some potential. I said, well, I like this one, but it's, I will only get involved if I'm able to go in and you know adjust the story to make it work. So we did a short film called Fatima and the film, the story was really interesting and we decided to expand it into a feature film, but I didn't want to tell the same story because the way the short film was, it was structured in a way where it, um, it just had a good beginning, middle and end. I was able to tell that story in 20 minutes. The feature, however, I needed to expand it in order to do it. I didn't want to revisit the same, I took the same premise, but I took a whole different plot element and I turned it into something a lot more entertaining. And that's what ended up becoming Fatima's Revenge versus Fatima. And Fatima actually just made it to, uh, it's available on demand now. You can order it on uh, Amazon Prime and you'll be able to see exactly what I'm talking about. We just go in there, you can Google, um, you can search for Fatima and it'll come up. It stars Corto Davis along with Josephus Talbert and uh, Joe 
Rogers, an excellent actor, is able to pull off a really believable and interesting story. Right. Let me let let me play for for my audience uh, uh, something you put together as your project, so that my viewers can get a sense of uh, of your work. Okay. Excellent. Let me. Hear. If you don't mind, you can go over some of these things as the play because it looks like a collection of. Some oh, films. yeah, yeah. Well, I talked about the no limit stuff that I was doing. That was playing in the background there. Um, this is Illinois Scratch, one of my favorite groups that I've always worked with. Um, this is a promo video I did for someone when I moved to Georgia here. Um, this is another Liberian artist that I worked with, Jay Wills. We continue to do a lot of stuff together. We did a song called American Dream. This is one of my biggest budget videos we ever did which was another No Limit video. That's another Liberian artist, TK, that I work with. Illinois Scratch came back for video number. I forgot how many videos I've done for them. But um, they can take that time and go through it and really see it. But, you know, we, there's so many things. And this is all the stuff I did a couple of years ago. It doesn't even include all the stuff I did over the last year. So it's, um, it's pretty interesting to see how much work got put in. Uh, that's a clip from my Wu-Tang documentary that um, got picked up by BET and a few other networks. This is The Bully, a powerful short film about racism and um, Islamophobia that I did, it won a lot of awards over the place. So I just started to focus on a lot of socially conscious projects. And um, my goal is to try to just bring the talents that I have to make a difference. So, it's another client that I had, Egypt Sharad, uh, produced a lot of videos for her. Um, this is a book trailer I did for somebody up in um, upstate New York. I'm able to do some stuff. That's Joe B, one of my favorite Liberian artists. I did a lot of videos for him too. He's part of the GB Records team. Um, this is a promo I shot for the one of the love of hip hop stars some years back. So there's tons of stuff on here. There's not enough room to put stuff you know ah this is my man um, touch he's also one of the artists featured on the what do you call the soundtrack this is a tv show that i had for uh i was doing with waka flocka down here in, in georgia uh, so it's just fascinating to see the different types of work that we did i mean the, the quality is just incredible <laughs> there are people watching and say i mean is this a liberian Production? Yeah, you know what? The, one of the biggest things I came to learn is a lot of them, and there are a lot of people out here too, the Liberians that are very, very crucial to the entertainment scene, but a lot of people don't know who they are. I mean, there are producers that are involved in major projects that produce musical projects. There are, uh, you know, tons and tons of people that we have. There are actors, there's some bigger directors in Hollywood that probably, you know, that are way bigger than what I've been doing, and, you know, they are out there. So every now and then when you go out, you realize, okay, wow, I didn't even know that, um, what's the guy, Duncan 
um, was it Duncan? I forgot his name, but he's a, another actor, but he's, he's a Liberian. I was like, wow, you know, oh. finding out all these different people are Liberians also. So it definitely worked out. And there's a, there's a, there's someone on Facebook, uh, Nentu Jesus Love Me, say, I don't believe this guy can do all this. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, I don't, I don't find that offensive because uh, not many people will believe that uh, a Liberian, you know, have this kind of quality of production. Yeah, it's there, you know, like I said, I mean, unfortunately, um, a lot of them don't get a chance to see some of the things that I've, that I've done because they're produced by different clients, for different clients. I have hundreds of videos. A lot of them, you go to my website, a lot of them are locked, so you can't really see, but it's definitely um, a process. If you're just joining us, this is Focus on Liberia. Our guest tonight is Mr. Gerald Barclay. He's a film producer, he's a writer, a cinematographer, and, and also an editor. Uh, Gerald, let's go into, in, into some of your work. Your first feature film, which is a Bloody Street, came out in 2003. You were the director, the producer, and also the writer. Uh, in that film, you have the uh, main character, his son was killed in a bloody drive-by shooting. And so this guy became, you know, to take revenge. But mm -hmm. as you said in the movie, living by the gun fails to extinguish his anger at his son's death until he falls in love with, uh, with a girl. What really inspired you for that movie? Does it have anything to do with uh, the Liberian Civil War? Or no, that particular like project, York? I mean, not necessarily. That movie focuses on um, uh, gun violence, um, you know, Two, two really good friends of mine when we were younger passed away due to gun violence. And I was able to touch on the subject matter in this film because our main character is, he seems bulletproof until he comes across a African cab driver. And they, you know, through their interaction, he, 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 um, he kills the cab driver and is haunted by the memories of the guy. So it's, it's really powerful. I mean, it has a lot to do with African, um, Elements, uh, the actor that I used, the guy named Olatunde, I forgot his last name, but he's a Nigerian actor. We did a great job on that. And it did very well. It, it made a lot of noise. You know, I watched the film recently and saw that it still had its edge. Um, there's an old lady that's in there that really drives home the message of violence and the connection between Black people. And basically, what I would like, always like to do is to try to send messages through my work, to try to wake people up to issues that are dealing with in society. Yeah. You, you, you also produce a documentary, The Love of Liberty Brothers. Yeah, when I saw that, I said, oh, okay. Me, you know, the party is coming to Liberia, but that's not it. This is your, your personal story, uh, your family mm -hmm. leaving Liberia to come to the U.S. after the 1980 coup connected to the Civil War. Mm -hmm, you yeah. went back and did this documentary. Yeah, so tell me more about that. Yeah, as I, as I mentioned, I was away from the country for 20 something years after leaving in 1980. Um, by chance, I was able to, I was working for a dot com and then went back to Liberia to do, I mean, to Africa to do a documentary on hip hop. While I was out there, I connected with the Liberians living on the Budaburum camp in Ghana. And I was able to um, uh, interview a guy named General Butt Naked, or formerly General Butt Naked, Joshua Bly, who now is a preacher. And he gave a very interesting perspective on the war and what led to it and how we could avoid it in the future. So I was able to follow up with him with a couple of other interviews and we were able to, this time I was able to enter Liberia. I was able to get to Liberia right after Charles Taylor left. So it was interesting seeing the country and getting all of those memories back, as well as being able to, um, this chronicle, you know, the people who survived it and find out what they dealt with and how they were able to survive all those years. So it was very touching. The, the film was nominated for Best Picture at the um, American Black Film Festival and screened all over, you know, Woodstock Film Festival. So it, it got a lot of notoriety. And I actually ended up doing a part two to that. And this one focused on the uh, Ebola crisis that Liberia went through while they were still trying to rebuild. You know, it's almost like they almost had the building process and then Ebola just came and knocked everything down and set the country back. 
years and years. So um, that's a Liberia will rise. And when I finished up that documentary, I didn't get a chance to take it around as I did the first one, but it's still a powerful piece of my work. And hopefully one of these days I'll do like, uh, just showcase all of my work so everybody can see, because a lot of people don't know what I've done. So, so uh, uh, you're in that documentary on the love of liberty brothers here, was there anything new that you discovered from your interview, interview with uh, victims and survivors, apart from what you already knew about the Liberian Civil War? Well, interestingly enough, I mean, I was able to discover the beauty in Liberia, believe it or not, because I had made maybe four or five trips to Ghana and travel to other places around the, the, the world before going back into Liberia when I got there. I mean, it could be my optimism, but I felt like, man, this place looked really nice. You know, I thought it'd be littered with bodies or burned down buildings and, you know, destruction. But it seemed relatively, you know, well kept together. And I just felt like, you know, and one of the things I will say is I think the Liberians were able to bounce back because they don't, you know, they didn't seem to, they forgot quickly, put it that way. <laughs> so, so based on that documentary, were you able to uh, come up with the reason why we fought and were you able to see that? Were you able to glean it from? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, people, there, there are so many elements of it that people can take away, but in all honesty, I, I felt that there was a lot of deep seated um, animosity between the Liberian and American Liberian diversity with our country that needed to be worked out. I think that strategically Liberia, Liberia was positioned in a way where you have a lot of people interfering with the government. I mean, there's some things I learned just weeks ago about who may have been involved in the assassination of Talbert, which is the next documentary I want to work on, is the assassination of um, uh, President Talbert. I want to concentrate on all of the elements that was there. So when I started looking at the world as I, as I see things now, I realized that there were a lot of people involved in the destruction of that country, whether it be greed or whatever, or outside interference, um, people who were in the country and didn't really foresee how their involvement or lack of involvement would affect those 300,000 people that died and then um, going on to you know, setting Liberia back, you know, 50 years behind everybody else. You know, you know, at one time Liberia did have some sort of a say in Africa and it was looked upon in, in a respectful manner. And all of a sudden now you got people looking at Liberia as if, you know, it's like the trash of Africa. Yeah. And part of what I'm trying to do is just rebuild the, the the narrative to be able to spell everything out as it needs to be spelled out. That's, that's very important. And you, you already mentioned that our part two dealt with uh, a documentary on the Ebola crisis. Yeah, I did. I. By, you know, family. Why do you think it's, it was important to do a documentary on Ebola? Um, I felt, um, you know, when I went into, you know, I, I connected with the family of Eric Eric Duncan, um, who was the Liberian that came into the United States in his name where he was all over the news um, because he, he was, he had Ebola and people had this fear of Liberians and people were being discriminated against. And I saw how easily people can turn within literally uh, just a couple of weeks of it being splattered on the news. Liberians lost their jobs, they you know got discriminated against. And I wanted to kind of follow the stories. So when I went and interviewed the family, I got a different perspective about it and, and learning how their brother, sis, you know, brother was treated, son was treated throughout the whole process. I felt, wow, you know, there's a lot more to this. And I felt how um, the Liberian government opened up and allowed these researchers to be in Liberia unsupervised and they're, you know, researching the most deadliest viruses uh, in Liberia. And then all of a sudden they disappear and then you know you have this this epidemic, and then you find out that hey, how come there's cure for the Asian lady and the white guy and all these people that were not Liberians, 
you know, they had the, 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 the antivirus for them. And then all of a sudden this Liberian citizen dies. So it was really troubling. And then, you know, hearing Ellen Johnson, you know, really attacking the victim by saying, hey, it's his fault. When he comes back here, we're going to deal with him. I felt that was very, very sad for a leader to kind of throw their citizen under the bus. And I felt, mm, I don't know. So I, I did the documentary and I focused on just the backstory. And I basically, I make you try to think and question it. So when they, people who watch uh, Liberia Will Rise, they'll see, wow, okay. There's a little bit more to this than, 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 um, than we thought. Yeah. Still on your work, let, let's, let's talk about uh, your book, Shooting the Wu-Tang Clan. Is this called Shooting the Clan? <laughs> Shoot, yeah, Shooting the Clan. Um, yeah, that book, as I said, Chronicles, it's, it's a memoir. It's, it's basically me discussing all of, you know, all, all that I went through in terms of dealing with, um, uh, dealing with my production, meaning everything I did leading up, you know, most people who want to learn the most about me, they can watch that all the way up from the beginning of my career or even leaving Liberia and the sentiment behind that and coming all the way here and what we had to grow, go through living in housing projects in New York City, all the way to getting these opportunities to be able to shine as a filmmaker and get my art out there. So uh, it really chronicles that. And it, you know, it, it's, it's sort of um, for up and coming filmmakers, I think it's a good read because you'll get a chance to see it. It's all about decisions and decisions that I made that I felt may have been wrong. And there's some decisions that I made and I still stand by, but at the same time may have hurt certain things professionally, but we're all gonna be faced with those decisions. And that's the important part about um, being a filmmaker. It's a series of decisions. I made a decision a year ago to stop what I was doing to focus on getting Fatima's revenge out. You know, while I was doing that, I decided that I was gonna stop for a month to produce my opioid addiction you know, uh, project that I'm working on now. So all of those things, um, you know, so the, the this general sense of it is making decisions. Okay, when RZA from the Wu-Tang Clan asked me to do a document, I mean, hit their video, I had to make a decision whether I was gonna do it or not. You know, uh, during the process, certain things happened and certain decisions that I had to make. You know, so it was, it's all about decisions and seeing opportunities and jumping on it and then following your guts on, things that you feel and believe is the right thing to do. You already mentioned uh, about Fatima and then Fatima's revenge. Oh yeah. So just tell me a little more because I, when, I, when I watched that, I mean, the, uh, the footage was very much inspiring. Yeah, so Fatima's revenge focuses on a, um, the, an immigrant and the reason I took to the story because when we grew up in New York in the 80s, late 80s or mid 80s, um, a lot of the work that li the Liberian refugees who were escaping the war could get was working. One of the easiest jobs you can get is to work as a home health aide. And when Musa Sisse approached me to uh, do that project, I identified with it because I knew what a lot of these Liberian women and you know a lot of immigrant women do. They have to take care of these older people. And I just thought right. put a twist on it, what would happen? If she gets on the job and the guy she goes to take care of is a blatant racist and he is hell bent on, you know, killing her and getting away with it. So my character thrown into that world and she needs to try to figure out whether she's gonna fight or you know, or flight or if she's gonna have to, you know, sit there and be killed. So what, where can we find these if you want to, someone want to buy them? Well, I think there are some links that are put. The original Fatima short film is available. Uh, you can watch it on Amazon right now. Um, if you have Amazon Prime, it's free. Um, but you'll be able to see what started it off. A lot of people, you know, waiting to see the feature film Fatima. We've been traveling with the film in various cities. We did New York, we did Providence, we did Minnesota. Um, we did uh, uh, Atlanta, we screened in Atlanta twice. And the, re the response was amazing. And where we are now is um, 
we have a couple of more cities and then I'll just work on getting it on the platform. So it would be Netflix, iTunes, uh, Amazon Prime and everything else. So I found out recently that Amazon Prime comes with Comcast where you can literally tune in on your cable box and get Amazon Prime, which is amazing. In one of your write-up on your website, you talk about the cost of producing a movie. That, that is, and you said like uh, something almost close to a million, you said? Well, I'll say like this. I mean, there was a trend that happened after the 90s, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Hollywood went looking for music video directors because they worked under tight budget constraints. They work on the short time and they're able to get a lot done. So it was this rush of trying to get at uh, music video directors. And um, so as the budget shrunk because the music industry wasn't making that much money, a lot of these filmmakers, a lot of these music video directors shifted. So budget wise, we were able to learn how to make the most out of very little money. So there are little tricks that I learned doing these high-end music videos that I was able to apply to my filmmaking. So let's say Hollywood would say, you know, $2 million is a, they call that low budget or 500,000 is what they call ultra low budget. But the funny thing is I was, you know, able to make Fatima's Revenge for under 50 grand and we were able to pull off a really, a really strong, um, project under the resources that I had. I, you know, I use my house as a, one of the primary locations. Um, I use actors that are a part of my camp. I was able to get funding from people who were close to the team. Um, and um, it really worked out. Yeah, I, I read that you, you were doing it close to home because it would be costly to go far places to do the shooting. Yeah, I mean, that is definitely true. I mean, there, I mean there, many, there are stories that are told in one room, you know, that are still interesting. But I, I live in Atlanta now, and there are so many resources that we have here. I try to take advantage of it. So there's so many actors that are available. The um, higher end, I was able to get Clifton Powell to really come and work with me. And, you know, he was able to work with the little budget that I have, but he did a phenomenal job and he brought a lot of credibility to the project. For most people don't know that's, this he's um you know he starred in um Friday and a whole bunch of films. He's actually one of the hardest working actors out there, and he came on board and really you know laced me with a excellent performance, and we ran with it. So where where and how do you find these people who are acting your films? Well, believe it or not, um, I keep like the way I kept a mental record of all of my ideas. You know, there are a lot of people who approach me all the time. And, hey, you know, if you ever need an actor, call me. So <laughs> every now and then I do call them. I'm like, hey, remember you said you're ready? Okay, I got a part for you. And we just run with it and go ahead and pull things together. So where do you draw your inspiration for these films? Uh, I mean, it. if, you know, we're inundated, anything you could take a story and then put a, a, a Liberian twist on it, or you can take an old story and, you know, change the location. Okay, we'll take this and we'll set it, you know, like my stuff mostly is set in the basement, but it actually worked, you know. So um, I draw from different things. I mean, like I said, I come from the world of music videos where every week or every other week I had to come up with a idea to, to put a, a film project to. So it was just, simple to apply that. I might look at a movie and say, damn, why didn't they go this way? I said, if I got a chance to do that movie, I'll be able to tell it this way. So these are all things that you get a chance to do. I say, well, I will, if I had a chance, I would tell this story with this actor or I would give it with this ending, you know? Any filmmakers you admire and why? Oh, there, there are many, there are many. I mean, everybody from Spike Lee who really kicked the door in, you know, Melvin Van Peebles who started the whole black exploitation era in the 70s uh, with, you know, Sweet Back Badass Song and all the way up to even the Nigerian filmmakers who were able to take advantage. These guys are banging out movies, you know, utilizing resources that you know, they, they have around them to go, but 
everybody from Robert Rodriguez to what's the guy's name? Um, F. Gary Gray is one of my favorites because he comes from a music video background to you know, Ridley Scott because they have this big, big production, high end production, and I try to watch it. Tarantino, uh, Orson Welles, uh, some of the films that inspired me, you know, like one of my favorite films, a movie called The Bicycle Thief. I watched that under the tutelage of Tony Lover, my mentor. He had thousands of movies, so we just sit there and watch all of these films. And then when DVDs came in, I was able to watch these films with the running commentary, which explained what they were going through. And it made it interesting because you were learning while you were watching. The, uh, the, you, the Love of Liberty, you know, brought us here was uh, that documentary. Did you shoot that part of it in Liberia and Ghana? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We shot it in the United States. Uh, I know George Weir at the time was still, I think he was just getting out of his soccer career. I got some parts of it with him in there. I also got um, a lot of people who showed a passion for what was going on in the country and they were really helpless. I was able to go to Washington, D.C. with some group of protesters. And I even followed through with some people who actually moved to Liberia and followed through on their promises. A friend of mine, um, Ruby Forbes, who actually ran as a vice president in the last election, with someone that I went to high school with. And she basically was a part of it. So it's a lot of people that were a part of. And it was kind of like me getting re-familiar with my uh, my Liberian roots and culture and realize that that little thing that I do, there's still people now who I meet, you know, I did that documentary, you know, 15, 16 years ago, I, was, I started shooting it. That still come up to me now and recognize me that, hey, you did that documentary on Butt Naked, you know, definitely. Yeah, you, you met Butt Naked. <laughs> yeah, he's actually one of my one of my good friends. I, I got a movie project I would love to do with him. That's uh, acquired the rights to do his life story. That's one of many ideas that I have in my little folder there that I will hopefully be able to do soon. Right, I have a I have war experience too. Maybe one day I'm able to tell my story. Let me tell you something, my man. There are millions and millions of stories out there that needs to be told. I remember. Um, Patrick Burroughs telling me some fascinating stories about Liberia. I want to recap, just revisit those stories. Um, and like I said, there are tons and tons of stories. And, you know, like I said, this 2018 was a good year because we got a lot of stuff done. I worked on a boxing movie. I just recently did a basketball movie with one of my director friends that I work with. She just directed the movie. I did the cinematography and we're in the editing stage of a movie called It's Major. And then uh, last year or the year before, I was able to work with another Liberian filmmaker, uh, Dr. Kula. We worked on Providence. So I shot all the, the American sequences. That's another. So we're slowly getting there. And I think within the next five years, we should definitely be able to go uh, have a real good footing in the African film market in terms of, you know, we're not going to catch up to the Nigerians. There's too many of them. But definitely to be able to produce quality films like uh, their South Africans bring produce real good quality films. That's my goal is to pr produce films that are not just gimmicky or there to just capitalize on the fact that they're doing movies, but do stuff that can stand the, the test of time. Yeah. Are there other Liberian filmmakers that you collaborate with sometimes? Or oh yeah, I just, I just uh, mentioned um, Dr. Clarice Kula who's doing a lot because she does a lot of collaboration. Yeah. But, um, um, there's also another, um, uh, Stantor Bishop is a guy who, you know, we grew up together. He's also a filmmaker and he's involved. I had him involved in the writing of Fatima's Revenge. He did the cinematography for the short film. And there are tons of guys, like I said, Musa Seisei is a filmmaker also, but he's also involved in, um, he stepped on as an executive producer of uh, Fatima's event. So we all rally around and try to make things happen. So in terms of Liberians, there are quite a few names. I can't think of everybody right now, but in my immediate circle, those are the people who worked on it. Even Corto Davis, who is, uh, she's also a filmmaker herself. And she um, um, recently launched the KD Film Festival in Liberia. She was able to 
turn the light on a whole bunch of other Liberian filmmakers who are making noise. And some guys just picked up cameras recently and they're doing phenomenal work. That, that's good. There are also a lot of Liberian authors. They write books. What is the process if you would take one of their books and say, hmm, this looks interesting. Maybe I can turn this into a film. Oh, I'm always interested. Um, I, you know, if they have my information, they can reach out and we can make some things happen. There are tons and tons of ideas. Like I said, you know, fairness, I know that I won't be able to do all of the stories, but if I can inspire other people and show them the process, they can right. then go out and do it because I was a reality, you know, even with the 56, 54 projects I found in my folder, I knew that I won't be able to do it all. So I either got to pass it on to other people or I may have to just pick out of it and then, or combine them. I might take two or three of them, make it into one thing, or, you know, so, or package it up and then sell a concept to other people. You know, those are all things that you could do as well. One small, ladies and gentlemen, this is focused on Liberia. We are discussing Liberian artists and our guest is Mr. Gerald Barclay. He's a filmmaker, a producer, and also a writer. I'm Dennis Jai, and we are broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. We want uh, for our viewers on Facebook, you can uh, chime in, ask questions, give comments, and so on and so forth. Let's, uh, let's see your connection of how do you work with people currently in Liberia, if, if you have any connection there, working with some people or those that you are training, whatever you may do with people currently in Liberia. Well, one of my biggest connections right now is Corto Davis. Like, I'm very fascinated by the work that she does. There's a guy named um, Christabel Peters. He's also another filmmaker. He was the cinematographer on um, the uh, Providence movie. And obviously, Van Vicker is doing a lot. So there are quite a few people out there. Like I said, we slowly kind of cross-pollinate and do some stuff. There's Allison Brown, who is one of the executive producers on this project as well. She also, we worked together on a short film some years back. She appeared in my documentary on the Ebola crisis. And then, you know, now she's working on her own projects as well. So there are a long list of people, like I said, um, you know, there are so many filmmakers that are out there. And I, the names escape me, but you know, I'm thinking about you guys right now. There's two out of Philadelphia, they're doing a lot of stuff. Um, and what I'm, like I said, my goal is to try to get them up to speed so that we can compete. Cause I know one of the problems they com <coughs> complained about was like their films were not being recognized on the same caliber as those Nigerian films. And one of the things I want to do is always just carve out my own path. I don't want to go and copy what they got. I want to just do my yeah. own thing and let them know that, hey, this is where I am. And that's what sets me apart because I'm constantly trying to figure out how to make myself stand out as opposed to follow. The minute you do that, then you end up falling behind. Yeah, uh, there are certain words that we're using here. I just want to go again to the basic cinematography, videography. What's the difference? Uh, well, of the two, a cinematographer is somebody that focuses on doing movies. That's, okay. or, you know, on a higher end. Videography is more on a prosumer level where people are just doing video. Anybody could be a videographer. You okay. videotaping stuff. You can, you know, I started off as a videographer. I was videotaping parties and weddings and those things. And then you can become a photojournalist where you start um, working for the news and, you know, doing those type of things. And then eventually you can do documentaries where you're using higher end equipment. What was crazy is the fact that uh, those two worlds merge, the video and the film world merge. No one really shoots on film anymore. So, but the equipment became sort of a hybrid. You have the high quality of shooting film, but without necessarily going through the process of developing a, a film and transferring it. And it's a whole process that we had to go through. Now it's much easier. So guys can go to, you know, Best Buy and pick up a, um, $700 camera and have access to high quality stuff. You, know, you spend a couple of thousand dollars and the rest is up to you because the quality that you can put out is way beyond what people were doing 20 years ago that had equipment that cost, you know, $200,000, you know. What are the challenges for your filmmaking industry? Well, funding is always a major one. And then obviously distribution. Um, 
but the um, when I, and I say funding, a lot of times um, getting getting the money to go and do it. I mean, I, I see people raise thousands of dollars to do a party with that dissolves in the air once everybody goes home and that's it. Or they spend money on the wedding ceremonies and then six months later, a year later, <laughs> the, the marriage doesn't work. Are, are you taking a jab out of a party, little man? <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, not at all. I just, I mean, listen, this is stuff that I've observed. I'm not a young guy anymore, so there are a lot of things that I've observed in the many years that I've been on this planet, and I realize that there are certain cultures, the reason the Nigerians have accelerated is the fact that their they they, art is one of their major factor that they've had yeah. you know, for generations. And because they support their art, they're able to spread their culture around in many ways where Liberians, unfortunately, they're just now getting to it. There's a new group of Liberians that I think that embrace the Liberian culture a lot more. So they're out there. So it's all they need is people to be able to support them in terms of uh, spending money on their artists. You know, if the artist is performing somewhere, make sure you support them. You know, in the years that I was in Nigeria, would never sit back and go say, well, let me go buy that Liberian movie. You could be Michael Jackson. They would not go buy it. So, mm -hmm. but, you know, and so you have to be able to protect that side as well, rather than just be open and just give your money freely to anybody. You have to say, okay, well, would I be able to help build, build my industry to balance it out? So I was able to do stuff to pay the bills, but then also do stuff for my community as well. So that's what I continue to do. So if I, if I can raise the awareness, by uh, producing a love of liberty or Fatima's revenge by uh, taking it to the next level. And then I'll switch and go do some stuff that's going to pay the bills and that's fine. But I try to carry the peg, just move it forward as much as I can in many ways, because um, the visual medium is a very, very important medium because you control how your, your people are seen. And if you can, you know, the reason Black Panther did so well because the Black director, uh, Ryan Coogler, who directed that film, approached um, the African culture in a way that, that was never really done before. And that's why everyone embraced it. And that's something I continue to follow on. So, so what's the future of um, the film industry in Liberia? And, and if, you, if you are aware of what is being done currently? Yeah, I think uh, once Fatima's Revenge hit Liberia, I think a lot of people are going to see it in a different light. I mean, the story is, you know, classical storytelling about a character being thrown into a world and having to survive. Um, and there is a structure that they have to follow in terms of writing and knowing how you can imperil your, your characters and knowing how, um, you know, you're rooting for that character to get out of the situation. And that's classical hero's journey that I had to tell. And this is what I want us to start focusing on and be able to, you know, instead of retelling the same, you know, Nollywood story, you can put your own twist on it. Right. So uh, if I, by my own example, can inspire people to do that, I think it'd be great. In, in Liberia, filmmakers struggle with monetizing their craft due to challenges like parody. What advice can you offer them, especially when it comes to uh, new ways of profiting from what they do? Well, the great thing about it now, right, is that you have platforms that are available all over and it doesn't cost tens of thousands of dollars for you to get your film once it's done into other people's hands. I mean, people in Africa are watching YouTube, if you, you know, right now, probably one of the number one distribution sites for Nollywood movies is through YouTube. People, they just put it on there and they get millions of views. And you can get money from that as well. So, you know, in the meantime, I mean, for me, I, I'll look at other platforms that would be, you know, a little bit more susceptible. As we speak, we're looking to get it into um, um, Silverbird Theaters, and hopefully that'll be able to get a different audience for the project and then just be able to tackle as many distribution outlets as we can. Your colleague, uh, Dr. Clarice, Kula has a performing art school in Liberia. Yes. Are you, you know, working on anything up like that? Or is there any way that you are helping or trying to train people in Liberia? Yeah, once I hit ground over there, I think it's a slow process, but I plan on literally 
um, and slowly getting there because like I said, I needed, in the process of what we're doing, the technology changed, um, yeah. you know, for a hundred years, it was done one way. And then all of a sudden YouTube came in and changed the game. So it's a whole different approach now. So it's, it's just regrouping and then be able to produce content that will give the capital that we can start doing it. But like I said, one of my best person on ground there is Porto because she's also a filmmaker as well. So hopefully, um, I know when she came, she needed some equipment. We got some equipment back there and software. That's a slow process that we can do, but eventually we'll get there. Any advice you will kids in like they wanted to be filmmakers or even people here like myself? Oh, no doubt. Um, definitely. Um, um, all I would say is there are a thousand stories out there. You know, you got to be able to do projects that's going to affect people. Um, and if you can do, if you can do that, I think that's where you will end up winning because every, you know, we all have an opportunity to say, um, let's say, Cameras and cell phones are all available for people to make a statement. And sometimes it, it hurts me when I'm online and seeing people use the medium by they're, they're using that medium to diss each other or put people down and not necessarily use it as an uplifting uh, process. So as we, the best thing I would say is understand how powerful the visual medium is and use that to either educate or elevate your people to the next level. That's, that's, that's powerful. Let, let me go to Facebook and see uh, some comments. Uh, Larry Davis said, what is your thought about the Black Panther movie? I know you talked about it earlier. What is my who about it? Your thoughts on Black well, Panther. I thought it was a great movie. I felt like, you know, Black Panther proved something that, you know, Black filmmakers have been trying to uh, get across for years that people are interested in the black stories. And, you know, there was a time, I remember I did a, a script for a project and it was a story about black love. And some guy commented and said, I love the story, but I can't see black people falling in love. So it was like an insult by saying, hey, you know, there's no such thing as black love. And I felt like, wow, these people are really, really blind or behind, you know, this whole, you know, and, and there are people who give into that and end up doing projects to add on to the stereotype. I tried my best to stay away from it because um, the least, the last thing I want to do is to do stuff that's going to take it in a different direction. So if you look at, all, you know, whether it be the music videos or whatever that I do, I try to put something in that and say, okay, whoever it is behind the camera, it's not a dummy, he's trying to say something, you know, and yeah. in many ways I try to push it out. Like I said, even Bloody Streets, as violent as that movie was, had, you know, I picked up a whole different audience of people who were very conscious and trying to do some upliftment. And then, you know, all the way up until, up until Fatima's Revenge right now, where I touch on things that, everything from racism to, you know, the, the very violent nature of living in the United States or immigration, and, you know, those are the issues that I touched on. And then with my opioid project that I'm working on called The 16, I touch on, you know, the drug abuse and the drug epidemic that's caused by, you know, people being addicted to opioids and how the uh, pharmaceutical industry is behind getting all these drugs to people. And there's probably a direct correlation with, you know, the invasion of, Afghanistan, where most of the stuff is produced. Were you involved in your mom's uh, music video? Oh yeah, I, I, as I, it's funny. Um, yes, I produced that. I was just messing around years mm -hmm. back, and I was, oh, I'm gonna, you know, she has the perfect personality for it. So like, we went and shot the video. I took the video to Liberia and dropped it off at the TV station. The next day, I was filming for the love of liberty on Ducar palette i heard the little kids singing the song and that's how i knew how powerful um everything was yeah 
yeah so it's 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 definitely a um it's it's a powerful medium to see how easily yeah. I have a last, my last question from Facebook. How can a fame maker market the Liberian story? Liberia is a fascinating country. Um, well, you have to do stuff for your people. So if, if only the, the three million or three and a half million Liberians that are out there go and see Fatima's Revenge, I would have won already because that's what it is. You got to do stuff for your people. And just based on the, the screenings that we've had, I mean, people outside of the Liberian community love the film. So hopefully, um, uh, making, you know, making, um, just be able to carve this, this little niche and say, okay, you know what, worst case scenario, this is a film that was made for Liberian people, but then if other people outside of that embrace it, that's it, it's almost like the Indian film market, they do Indian movies for Indian people, but a lot of people grasp onto it. Same thing with the martial arts film that happened in the 90s. I mean, in the 70s, they were making Chinese movies and everybody else jumped on it and started following. So it's very fascinating to see um, um, <clears throat> yeah, just fascinating to see how easy people can can build an industry, you know, the Nigerian yeah. films were done for Nigerians mainly, and then other people from other places in the diaspora all follow it, and they have millions of people um, uh, um, coming over there to, um, to, to follow that world. So the same thing with the Liberian film, film market, we can build it and let the story, you know, reach across universal a universal basis then we've won right i have three minutes for us to conclude this broadcast no problem so how you how you marketing your your you know what what you do and what is the level of support you are getting from diaspora liberians oh right now the stage that i'm on is just building an an, an audience and a buzz on the film a lot of people who saw it um it scored very high in terms of using a, a, a rating system where whenever there's a screening, people can text in their rating of the film. And we scored a 93 the first time we did it. And the second time we scored a 96. So it's, 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 it's a film that's doing extremely well. Uh, people can follow us um, by going to thefatimamovie.com. Uh, my next screening is scheduled for Bridgeport, Connecticut. And then, and then uh, after, it'll be right after the new year on the 6th, I mean, on the 4th, Friday the 4th in Bridgeport, Connecticut. And then um, I got another screening in Milwaukee. And, um, and then once we're done, like I said, we'll be able to get it on a platform where you can you know, click on your phone and be able to watch it because it'll be available. Well, General, it's been a pleasure having you. Let me hear your final thoughts before we can uh, conclude this program. Well, I, if I can inspire anybody out there, like I said, there are tons of ideas and, I, and it's a shame to see how many people are creative, but they, you know, leave this planet without really getting the art out, out of them. And it's something that um, you have to do. I think in painting, the people become valuable once they die is when, you know, they their work and their art sells for millions and millions of dollars. So sometimes people don't appreciate you while you're here, but once the work and the art lives forever. So if you can, if you have ideas or stuff you want to do, do it and don't be afraid because what happens is, you know, there's nothing worse than people giving up on their dreams to do what they had to do. And sometimes, like I said, the journey, when you read the book, shooting the clan has been a long and sort of a painful journey, but I wouldn't change it for nothing. You know, it's a fascinating well, story. Thank you so much for uh, accepting the invitation to be here. No doubt. We, I uh, we do our best to uh, educate, promote, and elevate all things like Bureau. So it's been a pleasure having you. And uh, on behalf of uh, my co host, Daniel Knuckles Goshard, also my guest relations manager, Stephanie Cetro, want to say thank you so much for coming. And uh, to our guests, uh, to our audience, and our viewers out there, we also say, Thank you so much for watching. This, my name is Dennis John and saying, God bless you. And uh, happy, happy new year. This is our last, um, our last broadcast from the year. So I thought we ended strong with Gerald.
<laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. you Thank know. you again for coming. I hope I delivered by inspiring somebody to go out and pick up a camera and do something. Yes, you sure did. <laughs> I like the music too. That's great. Thank All you. Right. All right.